In this screencast, we will be back to focusing on input output rules. And we are going to focus on a particular type of input output rule known as a function. So we're going to start here with this first slide, just motivating the idea of function. So suppose Radical Gym charges a one-time initiation fee of $120, then $6 per workout. Suppose Prime Gym charges a one-time initiation fee of $150, then $4 per workout. Let's let W represent the number of workouts and let capital T be the total amount of money spent. Complete the input output tables below for each gym. Let's first focus on Radical Gym. So suppose someone has worked out two times. How much money have they spent in total? Well, at Radical Gym, it cost $120 just to join and then $6 per workout. So if they worked out twice, they'd have to pay $6 twice and also still have paid the $120 initiation fee, leaving us with $132 here. So if they worked out twice, they would spend $132. What if they had worked out four times? How much money would they have paid in total? Well, they would have had to pay the $6 four times and then also the initial $120 initiation fee. Here we've got $24 plus $120 is $144. Now we can continue in this fashion or notice if the person worked out one additional time, that would cost another $6. So this would go up by six, putting it at 150. And if they worked out three more times from five to eight, three sixes would be $18. So it would cost $18 more, giving you 168. Or of course, we can just go back to the way we were initially doing it. Suppose someone worked out 10 times, then they would have to pay the $6 10 times. And they also need to pay that initial initiation fee of $120. This is $60 here plus 120 gives us $180. These are the total amounts of money spent for these particular number of workouts for Radical Gym. Let's now take a look at Prime Gym with the same number of workouts. At Prime Gym, the initiation fee is $150, then it costs $4 per workout. So if someone worked out two times at Prime Gym, they will have spent $4 twice plus the initiation fee of $150, giving us a total of $158. If a person worked out four times at Prime Gym, they would have to pay the $4 four times plus the $150 work uh, initiation fee. This gives us $166. We could also continue doing it this way, or again, we could say it costs four more dollars per workout. So if you went up by one, that would move this up by four, giving us 170. And then if this went up by three, three more workouts would be 12 more dollars. So this would go up to 182. And then two more here would take us up by a total of $8, giving us $190. So here so far, We've taken two input output rules and represented them numerically in the form of an input output table. As usual with our input output rules, we want to apply the ideas. So here's a good question. What's the meaning of the ordered pair 30 comma 270 in the context of the application? So think about that for a moment. And you may be saying to yourself, which gym are you talking about? Because there's two different gyms they don't have the exact same pay structure. So how do I know what we're talking about? This could be 30 workouts at Radical Gym for $270, or it could be $30 at Prime Gym for $270. So there's a weakness to this notation here. We don't know exactly which gym this applies to. Now we could go figure it out based on the input output rule that we were working with. However, Instead, let's create a notation that keeps track of which gym we are talking about. As you can see here, these are the input output tables we created on the first slide. This is the input output table for Radical Gym, and this is the input output table for Prime Gym. We want to create a notation that keeps track of the differences between Radical and Prime. Because, for example, 8, 168 tells you that if you work out eight times at Radical Gym, it costs 168 bucks. But 8, 182 would mean that if you work out eight times at Prime Gym, it costs $182. It's not the same. They don't have the pay structure, same pay structure. So we want to keep track. Let's call the relationship between W and T for Radical Gym. We're going to call that relationship F. And to represent the relationship between number of workouts and the total amount of money paid for Prime Gym, we're going to call that relationship G. 
And we could have named them anything we wanted to. Uh, however, you'll see coming soon why we used F and G in this case. Now that we've got them named, here is our notation. We're going to write the name of the relationship. So whenever I reference F, that means I'm talking about radical gym. And in parentheses next to F, I'm going to put the number of workouts. And I'm going to write that that is equal to the total number of dollars spent. So instead of just an ordered pair W comma T, I'm going to write this expression instead. Now to say this out loud, this is not red F times W. It has absolutely nothing to do with multiplication, this notation. This is read as F of W, F of W. So here to say this, we would say F of W equals T. Notice here that you still see W and T, just like you did in the ordered pair. But now we have this signifier out here letting us know that we're talking about radical gym. Let's do the same thing with prime gym and then compare. So again, the notation, we're going to first write down the relationship name, which we call G for prime gym. And then in parentheses, we're going to have the input W. And then we're going to write that that equals the output T. This again is read as G of W is equal to T. G of W equals to T, and it has nothing to do with multiplication. W is an input variable, but G is just the name of the relationship between W and T. So let's see the potential power of this right away. For example, if I said, what does 5 comma 150 mean? Well, I don't know if that applies to this or this table unless I have the tables right in front of me. Of course, you see that's a point in this table. It's not a point in this table. But if you don't have these tables in front of you, we don't know. So 5 comma 150 has to go with radical gym. So the way we could write this is f of 5 is equal to 150. And that tells us that for five workouts at radical gym, it costs 150 bucks. That f tells us that we're talking about the radical gym relationship. Whereas if the point was actually 5 comma 170, which again, if we didn't have these tables here, we wouldn't know right away, are they talking about prime gym or radical gym? So let's use the new notation. And the way you do use the new notation is the G would let you know that you're talking about prime gym. We've got G of W is five in this particular case equals T is 170. This is what we call function notation. As you will see, there's much more to it. However, one power of function notation is to keep track of different rules. Now that we've defined F to represent the relationship between the number of workouts and the total amount of money spent at Radical Gym, and G to represent the relationship between the number of workouts and total amount of money spent at Prime Gym, we can go back to what initially motivated us to do this. And really, instead of asking this question, 30, what's 30 comma 270 mean? Instead, it should have been this. What's the meaning of G of 30 equals 270? That now tells you, which this does not, that now tells you that we were talking about prime gym. So what the meaning of this is with respect to prime gym is if you work out 30 times at, at prime gym, that's the big deal here. At prime gym, then you spent $270. The new notation tells us which of the two gyms we're talking about. That's really important. Let's ask another question now so that we can get closer to actually defining functions and the corresponding notation. Is it possible for g of 30 to equal 270 and for g of 30 to equal 300? Since they both have g here, that means we're talking about prime gym. So this would say that if you worked out 30 times at prime gym, it would cost 270. Whereas this would say says that if you worked out 30 times at prime gym, that would cost $300. Assuming that prime gym has only one pay structure, this is not possible. Somebody that worked out 30 times and had to pay $270, and another person that worked out 30 times and had to pay $300, the person that spent $300 might be upset that another person was charged $270 for the same number of workouts. So as we formally define function on the next slide, 
We don't want something like this to possibly happen. Let's take a look. Our definition of function requires that for a relationship between two variable quantities to be considered a function, each input must have only one possible output. So in the previous example, 30 can't have an output of 270 and an output of 300. It can only have one possible output for each of the inputs. So this is our definition of function. And let's go back through the notation and see if we can work out some of the formalities. Again, the way that you read this is f of the input equals the output. In general, our notation always look, looks like this. You have your function name, whether it be f or something else, and next to that, you have the input. And that is equal to whatever the corresponding output is. Don't forget that equality is symmetric, meaning if a equals b, then that's the same thing as b is equal to a. So you may very well see the f of the input part could be on the right-hand side of the equal sign. However, notice the input is in parentheses next to the function name, whether it's on the left-hand side or on the right-hand side. So, for example, suppose we have h of t. And real quick, common function names that people use are f, g, and h. Those are the most common. Just like with variables, you often use x and y and then maybe z. With functions, people often use f, g, and then h. Um, and again, they do not represent numbers. They're the name of the relationship between an input and an output. So let's take a look at this example and see if we understand how the notation works. Again, let's suppose we've got h of t. Again, that's read h of t. What does h stand for? That is simply the name. It's the name of the relationship or the function that is the relationship between the input and the output. So h is just the name of the function. What does the t represent? Well, next to the name, you always got the input there. So the t is the input variable here. And then h of t itself, or f of the input, is the corresponding output. So h of t is the output that goes with the input t. So it's the output that goes with the input t. So again, h is the name of the function. It's representing the relationship between the input and the output. t is the input variable. And then h of t is technically representing the output that goes with the input t. So for example, if you had somebody asked you to find h of 5, that would mean what's the output that goes with the input 5. So h of 5 represents the output that goes with the input 5. under this rule h. With this new function notation, our ordered pairs, of course, are always of the form input, comma, output. But if you are using function notation, the ordered pair would be of the form input, comma, f of the input. This means exactly the same thing here, except this is using the function notation. Remember, f of the input is the name of the output that goes with that particular input. Also recall that each input must have only one output in order for us to use this function notation.